So today we are beginning uh, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, you know, one of the most famous uh, medieval romances. Okay, so we're going to read two medieval romances in this class. The other one's going to be the White Bath's Tale. Okay, so whenever we talk about the Canterbury Tales. So um, two, you'll get the two defining examples of the genre. But um, this genre was, this genre just goes to show that oftentimes this claim that the Middle Ages are the Dark Ages, that there wasn't any intellectual or inquiry or good literary production, right? This, these romances just go to show that that's, a, not, that's just false, right? You know, we do have some very good, highly imaginative you know, works of literature, you know, during the Middle Ages. Probably would have had more if history would have been kinder to some of these manuscripts, right? Like you can probably imagine how many manuscripts might have not made it to us to this day. You know, that might have burnt, manuscripts that might have burnt or something like that, right? So um, let me just, you know, one second. Let me, um, before we dive too deep into the story and talking about it, I want to, and the structure of the story and all of that, I do want to spend a few minutes just talking about um, the language of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, especially show you some manuscripts of uh, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. So um, you guys have to keep in mind whenever we talk about stuff like this, you know, the printing press was not invented yet when this poem was written, right? So, um, you know, in order to get another copy, another book of the poem written, written down, someone had to physically write it down, you know, on, uh, they didn't have paper either, right? They had papyrus and things like that. So, you know, that's one reason why that, you know, we, these kinds of things struggle to get down to us. Let me show you my screen. I have a couple of things to show you. So this is uh, the British Library's collection. The British Library houses the manuscript of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. As it says, um, this manuscript was also part of that collection that almost burnt down, right? When with this manuscript was right there with Beowulf, as far as manuscripts, which almost didn't make it to us. It says it was housed in the collection of Robert Cotton, which in the 18th century was stored in an ominously named Ashburn, Ashburn Horn House. On the 23rd of October, 1731, a fire ripped through the house and many manuscripts were destroyed. Beowulf was actually singed at the edges. And this poem could have easily fallen victim to that same fire. Right? Kind of crazy to think two of the greatest works in medieval literature were in that, the only copy was in that one place. Right? It almost didn't make it to us. But they have digital copies of these manuscripts. You know, as you see, um, there's nothing. There's nothing like more beautiful. There's a few things more beautiful, I think, than some of these old ma medieval manuscripts. And just like the drawings that they did in them. You know, very imaginative. Um, so is that like the actual uh, manuscript up there? Like the way it looks and everything? This is. This is. Yeah. This is. <laughs> this is the. This comes from the British Library's website. And um, you know, they scanned just a few pages of it just to kind of give us an idea as far as what it looks like. And as you see, uh, we'll have to zoom in close. As you see, this is kind of what it looks like. 
And this is something that I had some practice doing when I was in grad school with, but um, lots of times with these documents, notice you see like little marks above some of the letters and things like that, like right here where my cursor is. You know, what these people who wrote these medieval documents did was they often left letters out um, and just put little symbols indicating like what letter, like it's a whole code system almost. Like they would leave letters out of words like vowels and things like that. And they would just like put a little hyphen or something above it as a shortcut. They did that to save time, right? When they were writing, um, probably to save from getting a cramped hand, right? So oftentimes in these documents, you kind of have to uh, have an understanding of what different symbols mean. I'm very bad at this. Just because I'm very, like, I struggle to see it. I struggle to see on these, some of these documents. I'll, I'll be frank to admit, like, even now it's zoomed in as much as, as much as we can get it. It's a little hard to see, to say the least. Um, but this, this is called calligraphy, right? This is, this is called calligraphy. You know, this sort of translation of these documents and, making sense of the patterns that um, the documents, you know, knowing the code, you know, about what words are left out with different symbols and things like that. It's not as hard, it's not as hard to get to do once you learn the code, but um, it seems, it seems hard at first that, you know, if we, if we spent a couple of days in this class practicing it or something, we could do that. We could, you could figure it out, but that's more of a English major 400 level class exercise, more than a 200 level class exercise. But um, yeah, you see, and very the handwriting is very. Uh, it definitely has handwriting, right? This wasn't a document. You know, the font almost kind of looks like it's in italics almost if we were doing modern word processing. And this was, this poem was created roughly around 1400. So even now we see we were about 500 years in the future past Beowulf where we ended up the other day. Yeah, this is this is an image from part three and four of the poem, which we haven't read yet. Here's the green, here's a picture of the green knight. I think this is uh, Sir Gowan in his armor. So really, really neat stuff. Um, I do, I would encourage some of you guys, uh, this is gonna be, prominent over the next several weeks. They have these old manuscripts of the Canterbury Tales and things like that up on the here too. So I'll probably will show you some more, you know, as the weeks go by. Yeah, when I, when I did this, I didn't really do it with English documents. Um, the foreign language I took what was Latin. And uh, I looked at it, I, used, I had to translate over a Latin document written this way once. Right. was was not easy. <laughs> they say they say that uh, STEM classes are harder than humanities classes. I call bullshit. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but anyways, but this is the what the original Middle English language looks like with Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Um, You know, this language is readable. You know, it look, it, I don't know, you guys might say, hell no, it's not, right? I can't, I can't understand that, All right? But it is, it is readable. The, the, the Middle English of this poem is a little bit different than the Middle English we will encounter with Chaucer when we get to the Canterbury Tales. 
because this is kind of like a dialect. This uh, this poet, this whoever this poet was, was like lived in the country in England, right? So he even kind of wrote in this country accent, even for like Middle English time. The Canterbury Tales was written in a London dialect, right? This poem was written more in a uh, I don't know. I'm not sure what part of England this poem was written, was written in, but it was it did not have a London um, dialect. And if you take a look, this is the first lines of the poem. If you take, if you even if like you look in your book, first lines of the poem on 222 of the book. So if you if you read the translation and read the Middle English, it's written in the same word order, right? You can kind of make sense of what the words are, right? Since the sage spelling was not standardized in these middle in Middle English, so they're oftentimes the way they spelled words was how the words sounded, right? The the words of the spelling rules that we have now really didn't come into play until the 1700s. So if you ever do look at a medieval manuscript, or if you look at even something like Shakespeare and its original form, um, you guys, whenever we read Shakespeare, you'll get the, you get the, uh, you know, the translation, right, from, with, the, with spellings and stuff. But that's why the spellings aren't standardized. That didn't become spelling rules didn't become a thing until the 1700s. As you see, since the sage and the uh, sot was was uh, sased at Troy, then uh, you see here this three is a uh, calligraphy mark saying that letters were left out. So um, in a way, it's a shame you guys aren't reading it in the original. Some books, some textbooks do uh, have both. Like one page will be the, the original, one page will be the translation, right? But you can kind of see, you can kind of see, you can get an idea as far as what it looks like. So as far as the structure of the poem goes, you know, we have, this is a time where we're talking a little bit about literary form. Notice that, I don't, I don't know if you guys noticed this when you were reading it, the translation that we have does a good job um, continuing this on, but Beowulf was written a lot in this way too, right? But the way this poem was written, you repeat the same consonant sounds several times in a line. All right, so notice in line one, we have uh, three words that start with S, All right? The second line, we have four lines, four words that start with B. In this line, we have three lines that start with, words that start with T, All right? So that's how, that's how this poem works. It's an alliterative poem. You know, alliteration is when you repeat the same consonant sound several times in a line. That's a poetic effect, okay? So this, the way that this poem's structured, every, every little section of it is its own sort of piece to this puzzle. But the poem is structured in this way where we have about 20 lines or so we have about 20 lines or so, and then we have a little rhyming part at the end, All right? Just take a look in your book at, um, yeah, just take a look at the book at the line, about line 15 or so. So usually you have 15 to, tw to 20 lines, and then at the end you have this little rhyming part. You know, this little rhyming part, it's called the bob and the wheel. The bob and the wheel. 
So um, you have to, if you were writing one of these on your own, which you will have a chance to do later, because one of the assignments in the class is to imitate um, a poem style, right? What like we're going to read. You have to write your own poem at some point. This is going to be an option for you to do. But notice at the end, the Bob, you have one stressed syllable in the, uh, in the word. So, and grace, right? That's technically two syllables, but and isn't stressed, right? And grace. And then it rhyme, then it goes in an every other line rhyme. So we have grace, space, race, wonder, blunder. All right, so you see that every other line in this bob and wheel rhymes. But the first, the first part the, is the bob. That's the short part. Like I said, only, only one stressed syllable. And then after that, um, each line has three, three stressed syllables. So where war, there's, a, there's your stress, and feud, and wonder have ruled the realm of space. So usually about six syllables in a line or so, three are stressed. You know, this is, um, this is the will part of it. So later in the class, when we read sonnets, you'll find that sonnets are written in iambic pentameter. In a pentameter, that means that five, you have five stress syllables in a line. This is called trimeter because you only have three stress syllables. The lines are a lot shorter than they are in, in sonnets, okay? So the first 15 or so lines, it doesn't matter how many syllables you have and whatever line in, in the lines and all that. All that matters in the first 15 or 20 lines is the fact that you repeat that same consonant sound. But at the end of it, as you see each this bob and wheel kind of brings the idea of the whole 15 to 20 lines and it ties it together and wraps it in a nice little bow. Right, that's kind of the effect of, of the bob and the wheel here. And then if you take a look further down, you see another one, tongue, long, strong, duly, truly, right? You see that, you hear that every other tongue and long and don't really rhyme too well that's probably that's probably a uh, fault of the translation um, the next one feigned acclaimed named will hill all right so that every other line rhyme close to the end so it's a all is all said this poem's a marvelous achievement you know, to be able to do this, you know, to tie, to write so many of these, to tell this whole story together. So um, it's part of taking a class, I think part of taking a class like this is to get some kind of appreciation for how hard this stuff actually was to write. And so uh, hopefully that gave you, gave you some. What questions you guys got about manuscripts or Middle English or anything like that. Do you guys have any questions in that regard that I can answer? This is a good time to talk about it on day one of talking about- It's not really a question, but I'm gonna be honest with you. When I read the like first part for me and I had to go back and read it a few times because I was like having a hard time understanding like what was happening and everything <laughs> in the first uh, like probably 20 to 25 lines, but it wasn't really a question. I was just letting you know. <laughs> But I, I had to read it a few times. Once I read it a few times, I got a better understanding of it. But I guess well, I'm not so used to the way these uh, words are laid out and said and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, you took um, 102 with me, right? So if you remember, we read stuff like Frankenstein and Dracula yeah. and all that. Yeah. Right. It's much, this kind of stuff is much different than, yeah. than, than later <laughs> stuff. Right. Yeah, you don't really hear people speak, do alliteration or anything like that much anymore. It's still a poetic effect. Like if you guys write sentences and 
repeat the same consonant sound a few times in a line, I would be impressed, right? Do it too much and I might get annoyed. So, you know, just do it once or twice and I'm, I'm good, okay? Try to work that in there in my next writings. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, the story, the story of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, it follows this genre called a medieval romance. Medieval romance. And a romance you know, it has several parts. Dale, you did a good job uh, on the discussion board, kind of breaking this down. Um, I'll let you speak here in a second about what you wrote about. But medieval romances structurally have happy, they always have a happy ending, right? You, you, you can't have a medieval romance and not have some type of happy ending. So I say that now, you know, Sir Gallon's probably not going to get his head chopped off, right? Yeah, so, um, but structurally, medieval romances, it's, they're always much more than about what's literally happening in the story, right? This medieval romances oftentimes are about power dynamics, um, you know, how, the pa especially within like a king's court, right? Or within, within a kingdom, within a society, right? This, is, this should be an easy concept for us to grasp considering our society kind of went the hell in 2020, right? But um, medieval romances show a society that comes that falls apart and comes back together as a whole again. So they have three they have three parts. You know the first part is called an is called integration. Right, a medieval romance always starts with integration. That means that every time the medieval romance starts, it shows a kingdom that's whole, right? It shows a society that's whole and thriving. You know, at the beginning of this poem, um, we're at King Arthur's feast, right? Everybody's eating good, right? It's like it's like a golden corral buffet that, that they got going on, right? Everybody's gorging themselves. It's Christmas time. Everybody's merry and happy. All right. So that's kind of what's that's kind of what's happening at the beginning of this poem, right? It's it's Christmas and New Year's coming up. Um, I think I think we might actually be past Christmas, and I think we're looking more towards New Year when the poem begins. So we we have this this the holidays, right? The season of joy. And um, again, you know, this poem has a lot of Christian elements, but we can kind of even see here a lot of like the pagan traditions with with uh, that time of the year as well. Yeah, because I think they mentioned uh, the season of the Yule, and I think that's a pagan concept. It is. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the things that we take for granted today with Christmas don't really come from the Christian tradition, right? Things like the Christmas trees, you know, the wreaths and things like that, right? All that comes from more pagan um, types of celebrations. Christianity just kind of swallowed pagan, a lot of pagan traditions whole and kind of adapted them to suit its needs. But um, that's integration. You know, then in a medieval romance, we always have a part called the disintegration, right? We see in a romance a society that's falling apart at its seams, right? The world goes to hell in a handbasket, right? Sort of like what happened in 2020. <laughs> so, um, you know, without, it's pretty easy to tell that what this is in this, right? This, the green knight kind of comes in and ruins everybody's celebration, right? He's, he comes in with this awkward, weird request, right? If you hit, if you strike, if you strike a blow on me, I'll let somebody strike a blow on me as long as I can strike one back in an entire year from now, right? So very much a weird request 
to come into to come into a court with. So uh, nobody wants to do it, right? Everybody's like, this guy's kind of crazy. Right? Why, why should anybody do this? He literally wants us to cut his head off. So King Arthur's like, screw it, I'll just do it. Right? And then, but then that's when Sir Gowan stands up. He says, well, you know what? If anybody needs to get their head cut off, it's probably me. Right? I'm, I'm the weakest knight. I'm the m most unnoble knight. Right? Don't don't sacrifice Lance a lot over here, right? You know, you know, I, I'm the, like the pawn in the chess game. I mean, I, I can be sacrificed. Kind of, kind of a grim, suicidal way of looking at it, right? <laughs> right, but um, you know, we find out that he cuts the Green Knight's head off. The Green Knight's using some type of magic, right? To he puts his head back on. He's like, okay, buddy, in a year, you know, you have to come get yours, All right? So um, that's pretty much part one of the poem. But the last one, or, or, or give me sorry, just, give me just a second, Cole. The last part of a medieval romance is called the reintegration at the end, All right? Oftentimes in a medieval romance. The, well, not oftentimes, always in our medieval romance, the society comes back together again at the end. Now, whenever, whenever we, you guys read the next part for next Monday, you know, question that I have, that I put that I will pose to you on the discussion boards is this: you know, it, structurally, it has to be a happy ending, but is it really a happy ending? Right, that's that's a question that I definitely will pose to you about this poem. Right, the society has to come back together, but is some of the reason why society fell apart still there? If that makes any sense, right? Are are the cracks in society still pretty evident even after the reintegration takes place? So that will be that will be a question I will pose to you next time. Whenever you, I'm not going to spoil the plot or how it ends, um, but that will be a question I will pose to you. So you know it's a happy ending. The question I will pose is: Is it really happy? Okay. So go ahead, Nicole. Uh, sorry for jumping in there and interrupting you, but um, one question that I kind of had about the initial challenge that the Green Knight gave. You know, I could have missed it, but I feel like he never specified that the blow had to be a mortal blow and that it had to kill him. And I just thought it was kind of strange that Gwen chose for it to be that way or that it never occurred that they could, you know, just barely hit him and then be done with it. And I also find it a little bit interesting that it wasn't specified that uh, the return blow from the Green Knight was going to be equal in measure of the first. Was it was it not specified that it would be? Ah, uh, it could have. I could have missed it, but I don't think so. If I have, someone correct me, please. Hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure that the Green Knight does say, "I will give an equal blow," right after after the first blow but i think i think you are right in saying that it doesn't, doesn't have to necessarily be a mortal blow I, i'm pretty sure pretty sure you're right about that one but it, he did say it was going to be an equal an equal blow that he would return right, so. okay well in that case then if i was in the place of Gwen, i think logically myself myself especially i wouldn't want it to be a mortal blow if he was going to do the same to me yeah, but you gotta think. I mean, the guy probably he probably didn't think his head was gonna be able to get uh, survive with his head being gone. Is what I would have <laughs> like. I think he probably just went for the kill because you know if he killed the dude, he might not had to you know take the final blow, take another blow from the Green Knight. But yeah, when the Green Knight goes to let him uh, take his first blow, he even d like pulls down at his collar and exposes bare skin so he can try to get a clean cut. But if the guy is green, then I feel like anything can happen after that. 
I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> He's everything about him's green, right? His beard, his skin, his clothes. Even his horse. Even his horse. <laughs> Yeah, this this is where you, you guys are right to point this out. Um, you know, realism realism is something that we can't think of whenever we talk about our medieval romance. Right? Realism only became a uh, realism became a genre in the eighteen hundreds. Right? As far as like literature, literature always has to be ingrained in the real, right? The real world. Uh, these mid this medieval stuff obviously is obviously is not ingrained within reality right? it's very it's very imaginative this is that this is high fantasy type of type of literature right so almost anything we read in here you always kind of have to go into it knowing that um, realism wasn't something that was valued as far as liter being literary, right? King Arthur says something pretty neat here too. He says, uh, cousin, take care, said the king, to chop once. And if you strike with success, certainly I think you will take the return blow without trouble and dom. He's basically saying if you hit him good enough, you're not going to have to worry about the you're going to kill him, basically. Right. So King Arthur kind of uh, encouraged the, the that blow. And he only had the axe to work with too. Like this axe was big enough to chop someone's head off. Yeah, I like that picture in that manuscript you was showing us. It gave me a better idea as a big two-handed axe. Right. Yeah, you can only imagine how difficult it was to lift and all that. Yeah, we have this kind of ominous uh, feeling lingering over the rest of the poem, then, right? What's going to happen to to Sir Gowan? Right? Is he going to? Um, I never, I never know if it. How? I need to look this up. I've taught this thing several times. But is it Sir Gowan or Gawain? I don't know. I don't know. We'll we'll say. Yeah, I, I was curious about that too. Yeah, we'll we'll say both, right? I, I, I will. I will look at if I if it is Sir Gawain, I will stand corrected. Okay. Yeah, but um, yeah, we have this whole ominous feeling lingering over it, right? A whole, so he waits a whole year, like he waits like ten months before he finally sets out in November on his quest, you know, to uh, find the place. And a lot of the this is something we can talk about a little too. A lot of, in part two, a lot of what he runs into is these obstacles on the way, right? He fights dragons, right? He fights giants and ogres and all this, all this type of stuff. Even on his, it's even kind of like mentioned in passing, right? It's like, yeah, Sir Gowan fought, fought all these things. Yeah, like it wasn't no big deal, but these are mythical creatures. Right. <laughs> Yeah, that's on page uh, 238. He said he had death struggles with dragons, did battle with wolves, warred, warred with wild men who dwelt among the crags, battled with bulls and bears and boars at other times, and ogres that panted after him on the high fells. Had he not been doughty in endurance and dutiful to God, doubtless he would have been done to death time and again. I took that as I really appreciated them putting that in there. It gave me a better context of the world that we're in. Because uh, the Green Knight was really the only uh, indication of something fantastical or mythical. But, you know, once they paint that in there, it gives me a better picture of what type of world this is. Right. This is a question for you guys. Uh, how familiar are you with some of this King Arthur, Arthurian legend stuff? Is it? Of course, we have like what? What was the Disney movie about the? There was a King Arthur Disney movie. I remember the Sword and the Stone. That's it. I don't know if it was Disney, right? But there's that animated movie. Um, 
I don't know if any of you guys ever read any of this type of stuff before, sort of about King Arthur and Guinevere and Lancelot and all of this. The only thing I, I've never read nothing like that. I have read Beowulf before, though, before we read it in this class. But other than that, I haven't read none of that stuff. What about movies? Have any of you seen any mo- like King Arthur type movies? I know. I think Bill. I think you said you had with the Sean Connery. Yeah. First night and uh, King Arthur, and then Charlie Hunnam was was in a. Uh, I think it was a Guy Ritchie film about. It wasn't that good, in my opinion. Right. There's the, there was the Merlin show that came out a few years ago about Merlin the Wizard. Merlin the Wizard was... Yeah, I think that was a British program, if I remember right. It was. It was. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, this all, this... all this Arthurian stuff was very popular in, these, in this time. Right? But this was... Arthur was this kind of king way back in the past... You know, but there is said to be a, excuse me, there is said to be a real historical King Arthur, right? But what we have now is just myth and, and legend and things like that. But you guys know, the, or, or go ahead. I was going to say, I, I love the concept of the round table, though. I've always really, really liked that idea because everybody's equal. I, I thought that was really cool. Right. You guys, you guys probably know the story about uh, Arthur and Guinevere, right? Guinevere was said to be like the most beautiful woman in the world, but um, she cheats on Arthur with Lancelot, right? And that that becomes a part of the of the conflict in a lot of these Arthurian legends. Um, yeah, that's Guinevere is often used as a there's a character to be like, oh, women, right? Yeah, they'll, they'll stab you in the back every time, right? They're, she's oftentimes used, was used in that type of way. Arthur was said to be a lot older than her, right? So that, that's one of the reasons why that she probably cheated on him. But yeah, Ga- Sir, Ga- Sir Gallen, right? He's just, he's like the junior guy on the round table, right? You know, he's, so many other knights that hold more esteem than him. So he like said kind of a kind of a grim way of looking at it, right? I'm the least important one. Just sacrifice me. I'll I'll do it. <laughs> What's interesting though is once he leaves Camelot, if that's you know where they're at, he's uh He's made up to be a big deal, it seems like. You know, everybody, you know, his his fame like precedes him wherever he goes. Yeah. When he gets when he gets to the castle at the end, right? He's welcomed, like they're bowing to him, welcoming welcoming him or giving him welcome. I was gonna ask if they did that to like all the knots back then, or was it like just something about him? It would have probably been they would have probably given all the knights greetings like that. Yeah, the um, I think I told you guys in the Middle Ages there was only three like really types of social classes. Right, you had the no, you had the king and the nobility, uh, the clergy and the peasants. Right, the the knights would have been in the nobility. Right, so they would have met these peasants out in the country, the peasants would have kind of been subservient to them right? and rec- recognize them as better, as their betters, right? It, real, knight, real knights would often be like the enforcers that helped keep these, that helped keep this kind of economic system together. You know, but I think I told you guys in a feudal, in a feudal economy, what would happen would be these farmers would spend day like the dark, you know, working this, these farms. And then the king, then the king and the nobility would come and take the take most of their earnings, most of their crops. So I think I told you guys about seventy-five to eighty percent of their earnings were taken by the king, and the knights were oftentimes the enforcers who would come 
to pick up the pick up the tab, right? To come pick it to come pick it up. Right. So they were they were kind of feared, right, by the by the commoners. Right? These are the, you know, the these are the bill collectors. So sure we now we know of knights with chivalry, the idea of chivalry and all this stuff. But in reality, that's kind of what they did. You know, they came and collected the bill for the king. Yes, chivalry. So there's lots of ways we can we can go in the next few minutes. Um, lots of several of you guys wrote about um, the Christian elements in the poem, especially with uh, his armor. Um, let's see, I didn't do the armor, but I kind of got a resemblance from when he was um, going through nature. How when Jesus had to go through the uh, forty days and forty nights through the desert and stuff to get to uh, his goal and stuff. I kind of like, I've seen some similarities to that because he was in the nature for the longest time. He even was begging to God and everything, you know, to help him find the some kingdom or somebody. Right. Yeah, and it, it's about that um, 40 days or so. It's about what he spends, like wandering through the woods, right? Now that you say it. Because by the time he gets to the where he's at, where he's at at the end, it's really close to Christmas. I mean, so that makes sense for sure. The, that that comparison. I think it was Kara. You wrote about it. You want to uh, elaborate? Yeah. Um. Let me find my post real quick. <laughs> right. Nicole, Nicole, you wrote about it too. Um, while Carol looks hers up, you can you can talk about what you wrote about if you want. Sure. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting about the armor itself, I'll get into the Christian aspect of it in a minute, but I think it's interesting that when the Green Knight comes to uh, give the challenge, he's not wearing any armor at all. And of course, since Gwen isn't going directly to him and he's kind of going on a quest, he dons the armor. I'm interested to see if he actually wears the armor upon meeting with the Green Knight. And if he does the, I don't know, kind of shows the same respect, I suppose, or the same willingness to, to succumb to that blow. But with the armor, honestly, I got a lot of, I felt a lot of resemblance to Beowulf's armor where you know, it kind of represents the armor of God and the gospel. And especially with his shield, the pentacle that was on it, it talks about that pentacle uh, was a symbol recognized by Solomon or something like that. And it has no end, no beginning. And uh, it also resembles the five, the five points resemble the five traits that Gwen himself displays and also most knights display. Let me let me show you guys just a quick image of that shield. This is what it this is what it looks like. Like the pinnacle. Now this would have been what his shield would have would have looked like. Of course, um, you know, this is an interesting. It's a Christian symbol, but it's also it's also been adapted later as almost a satanic symbol too, right? Depends who you talk to. What who's who's using it? I suppose. Isn't it like the Pentagon is the satanic symbol when it has the not the Pentagon, but when it has the circle pentagram. around it? Pentagram. Yeah, the pentagram, and then the pentacle can be a pagan symbol if it doesn't have the circle. I believe. Kara, are you ready now to talk about what you read about? You gave some really good stuff about scripture, like how the description reminded you of scripture. Yeah, like Nicole said, she had brought up that Gowan was 
had those five traits of like humility, integrity, loyalty, and to an extent, honesty in first Corinthians, the Bible talks about those are some of the traits that are described to be as love. And even at, um, I think it was line five, it was in the five eighties, maybe five eighty five. He had said that it was godly wear. He had, let me find it. He said he was given all the godly wear to give help, whatever. And that even plays into the other scripture that talks about the armor because it says, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power put on the full armor of God. So you see that in there as well. Right. So, yeah, that was that was definitely an interesting comparison that the poet might have. When they were talking about the armor of God, right, you, in this case, it's the armor of God is met more metaphorical. Right. In this case, it's literal, right? very literal. Another thing that I noticed is that the word pentacle is actually uh, capitalized when it is first described. And I thought I that was that uh, to you. I thought it was very interesting. Yeah, that's line 620, it looks like, when it's first mentioned, because it gives you a little footnote about what a pentacle is. It says that the symbol which Solomon conceived once to betoke holy truth by its intrinsic right, for it is a figure which has five points. And each line overlaps and is locked with another, and it is endless everywhere. And the English call it, and all the land I hear the endless knot. Therefore, it goes with Sir Gowan and his gleaming armor. For ever faithful in five things, each in fivefold manner, Gowan was reported good and like gold, well refined. He was devoid of all villainy, every virtue displaying in the field. Thus, this pinnacle knew he carried on coat and shield as a man of true troth, most true, and knightly name. Annealed. So, yeah. You can kind of, when I read it out loud, you can kind of hear those consonants roll off my tongue, right? <laughs> it has a sing song like quality about the words do. Another thought that I was just thinking about, I can't believe I didn't think of this sooner, but it kind of reminds me of the story of David and Goliath. I don't know if you guys have ever like heard about that or not, but David was like, um, he was small and Goliath was this huge guy and when they fought in battle David wore um the armor of God like he didn't wear the armor that they gave him because it was too big and he wanted to be comfortable so um yeah it kind of reminded me of that he wanted to be nimble and quick instead of in that the real bulky armor they gave him right Yeah, you can all you guys can all, only kind of imagine how difficult it would have been to wear that bulky medieval armor, right? Made ever made you slow. Um, and you know, you guys know what it looks like. I can't imagine even like walking around in it. I bet that would even be just like tiring in and of itself. Another thing that I was kind of wondering about in line, I think it is. 568 it says first a crimson carpet was cast over the floor before he stepped on it i almost wonder what that would represent in that line i just took it as like a red carpet like you would lay down before somebody right i was just wondering like what the significance of laying the carpet down was before he stepped on it i noticed that as well and i kind of thought i know that Oh, I don't know if it's uh, in Juda Judaism or if it's in Islam. You have to like clean yourself before you actually touch the book and you have to lay a carpet down before you touch it. And that's what it made me think of. Like if that armor was viewed as something really holy, if you had to literally make the place that you put it on and the place that you mess with it holy as well. Right. That's a really good point. I didn't think about that. Yeah, that makes sense. And I noticed that he's arming from his feet upwards, not like down. What do you, what do you think is the significance of that? Um, well, 
I was just thinking about it, and I know that this is a little bit different than what I've posted in the discussion board, but um, his armor starts at his feet, and your feet is kind of like your foundation. So as long as he had his foundation set first, then everything else was going to follow through. I think that could also actually play into the carpet itself. I had never, I had not even thought of that. Or why they would lay the carpet down. And also, it just occurred to me, uh, a lot of times in the Bible, it talks about uh, making your, making your, like your heart fertile, like the soil fertile to plant the seed for the gospel. And I feel like that could play a part in it as well. It talks about if you have a rocky soil or if you have a closed heart that's not open to the gospel and things like that, then the seed won't take and you won't have faith. Right. It also not even talks about that, but it talks about having a firm foundation to even build your house on. So that could also play into it since you all brought that up about the shoes and the carpet. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that all the, a lot of you guys focused in on that question. Um, it, it is curious, though, because the, the poet does spend so much time talking about this armor, right? It is, it does have significance. Right, and it talks about, another like, thing that, you go on, Kelsey. Um, another thing, too, is, like, it talks about each piece of armor, like, in depth. It's not like it leaves anything short so it reminds me that like all these pieces have a significant purpose and without one of these pieces of armor then you could potentially like obviously get hurt so oh yeah for sure and I feel like the author described the armor in such a way because they didn't want to leave any of it to interpretation they had a very set idea for that they wanted the reader to come to and another thing that I noticed is that when it was describing the armor, the armor itself was steel. I don't think it was gold, but it talked about the joints of it being gold. And I couldn't really think of what that meant. Did you all come up with anything for that? No, I was wondering the same thing, actually. Will you repeat that, Nicole? Um, in one part, it, I think when it's talking about the pieces that go on his thighs, it talks about the joints that connect them are gold. And it made me, well, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking, why wouldn't all the armor be gold? And it made me think of trying to avoid vanity, maybe. That's one of the things that I thought of, but I really wasn't sure. Yeah, that, I think that could probably be it, right? One of your guys' complaints about Beowulf was his, he, does, he did seem kind of vain, right? You know, he was all about the treasure and and all that, you know, so this poem, maybe not as much, right? you might, you might see more of a humble, a humble Christian ideal here more than you did in, in Beowulf. Yeah, I think it's very evident in this piece that the Christianity and it was in it from the moment that it was written and from the moment that it was conceived that it wasn't just thrown in there it's very core thread throughout the whole the whole piece right yeah that's usually very indicative of, of any type of night tale is you know they're they're usually pretty holy and virtuous So one thing we probably need to talk about more is, is, is the idea of chivalry, right? Because as I bring this up, because it's a theme, because it's going to show up in part three and four, right? But this, lots of times these medieval romances and stuff, they did deal with this idea of, of chivalry. You, know, you, guys will you guys can probably guess that um, from the ending today, um, Remember the other day when we talked about Joseph Campbell, we talked about the seduction, like part of the hero journey. Yeah, we're gonna get, we're gonna get a little bit of this coming up. Um, so, 
but as you'll as we'll find out, he, this uses the guise of chivalry. So um, when G Gowan gets to this place, the Lord of the Manor is like, okay, you know, here's the here's the deal. You know, we're gonna we're gonna give gifts each day. So I'm gonna go hunt, and I'll give you a gift, All right? And then you give me a gift in return at the end of the day. Whatever you got that day, you can give to me, All right? So um, we're gonna see how this works with the idea of chivalry, you know, in uh, in the poem. You know, but um, well, this will be more of a discussion we'll have next time because it, it's much more evident. Um, yeah, the, this this type of literature is where this idea of chivalry comes from, right? How would any? How would some of you guys define chivalry? So, one of you guys define what you think it means. I feel like chivalry to me is always having an air of respect about yourself to those around you and really treating those around you as you wish to be treated. You know, whether that, I think a part of that is upholding the law wherever you are, which is a very biblical thing. Um, always being respectful towards others. Right. Yeah, I was in the military, and one of the uh, the the Air Force's it's uh, uh, service be service before self, integrity, and uh, excellence in all we do. That that kind of sums up chivalry to me. It's a selflessness, right? Putting others above above yourself, right? How do you see it working in like a romantic context, like relationships between men and women? How does how does chivalry come up? come up there i you would think it would be uh respect and uh the opposite sex but here unless i read this wrong he's he's kind of portrayed as a uh, big flirt as, as a as a james bond type uh like cool debonair yeah <laughs> yeah he's he's hanging out with the ladies close to the end here right he's kind of flirting with them a little bit he's noticing the lord of the estate's wife right he's like whoa yeah he's promiscuous at, at the very least <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this this is going to pay we're right to point this out because this is going to be part of the plot you know moving forward so this will hook this will be your hook moving forward what's what's sir gal gal we're going to do with with the wife of the manor right How's it relate to this hunting, this hunting challenge that the Lord of the Manor has put forth? We're gonna get it's gonna get we're gonna, it's gonna get wild on part three and four. Let's see you guys, let's see you guys know. So I'm more curious. Or go ahead. I'm more curious about the Green Knight than I am anything. I can see it foreboding uh, him messing around with some females. I, I I got that picture, but I'm curious what the Green Knight's motivations are. I almost went ahead and read the rest of this, but I didn't want to Spoiler. possibly ruin the uh, discussion. You know what I mean by knowing more than I should. I don't know why, but I kind of got the feeling that the Lord of the Castle that Gawain stayed at was the Green Knight. That'd be an interesting twist. That would be cool. What makes you say that, Nicole? Uh, just the fact that he's leaving to go hunt right, like just right before Gwen leaves. And just, I felt like he knew a little bit more than he was saying. He was like, oh, don't worry. The Green Chapel is just two miles away. And I thought it was very interesting. I'm excited to see what, I'm excited to see what comes next. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I was thinking the same thing. I was like, man, he's awful. Uh... He's being awful vague about, no, you know what I mean? He's very familiar with the situation, it seems like. And also, didn't it describe, like, his stature as being, like, a very big man and having a long beard just like the Green Knight? It did. 
spoiler warning, I, I'm beginning to think we, it might be him. I'm, 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 I'm bad at hold, I'm bad at having a poker face. So uh, yeah, I can tell it's definitely. <laughs> forgive me, forgive me. For Are we hot or cold? <laughs> <laughs> you're you're very hot. You're very you're very hot. So he has for this to end up being such a a good tale. He has to have a good motivation. I I hate a villain that's just evil to be evil. I, that's one of the worst uh, faults in writing. I think there is. I agree. I think it's hard to really. I mean, of course, you dislike a an evil character. But when there's no reason for it, I think it's always good to have a bit of compassion for the villains in the story, just a little tad bit. Yeah, it's really good if you can turn the story around and look through a villain's eyes and almost feel sympathy for them. If they're pure evil, and you, there's none of that. It also doesn't leave any room for the hero of the story to have conflict about it whatsoever, that internal conflict that, you know, in the really good stories they might feel. I think you guys will find that he has some interesting reasons for why for why he did this, why he set forth this challenge. All right, so um, yeah, I think I think you guys will be happy with how it ends. It it ends in a really neat way, I think. Um, I was wanting to, uh, to tell you too. I was watching a podcast yesterday, and it was about uh, most anticipated movies coming out this year. And there was a movie uh, with the titular title of The Green Knight that was supposed to come out last year. And I seen a trailer for it. It's supposed to, it's like a, it looks like a horror movie about the Green Knight of this story. Really? Yeah, and it's it's pretty hyped up. Like a lot of people have it on their most anticipated list. Yeah, that, that's really cool. I'll have to look up a trailer or something for it. Yeah, for sure. I do know that the uh, BBC did um, an adaptation of this back in the, yeah. Might as well show it to you in the few minutes we have. You know, they had, they had a version where uh, Sean Connery plays, plays the Green Knight. So I have to show you a two minute clip just because of that, okay. Young eyes have seen nothing of the world yet. Shall I snuff out their light? Shall these young lips grow cold before they have tasted life or touched a woman's cheek? <laughs> Defend their lack of courage. I came to challenge a man, not a beardless boy. And I give you a year's grace to grow your beard. Twelve sweet, short months of life to do with as you will. 
But when the seasons have come full circle, we shall meet again. And you shall pay your debt to me. What was the actor's name in that that played the Green Knight? I've heard his voice in a couple movies. Oh, that's Sean Connery, R.I.P. Yeah. Oh, I love I love it when he voice acts in movies. Yeah, that's Sir Sean James Bond himself playing. Uh... What I the only thing I've seen offensive in that was uh, Sir Gowan's haircut. <laughs> notice, notice how they he said he's going to give him a year because he needs he needs to grow his beard. I thought that was pretty funny too. <laughs> that was that was an embellishment of uh, of the story. You can, uh, it seems like they took a few liberties there. <laughs> His outfit's really cool there, though. You can kind of see like the green and how it fits with it. He's wearing the outfit he wore looked very pagan there. Um, but yeah, it did, especially with this headdress, even. Yeah. Yeah, I've never watched that movie in full. I am curious, though. I'm going to check out this Green Knight horror movie trailer, too. That sounds... I could be wrong on the genre, but it, it, I think it's horror. It looks really cool, though. Yeah, the, that movie it looks almost comic. It was, it was hard not to laugh when the body <laughs> walks and gets the head. <laughs> Yeah, you have, you have uh, Sean Connery deadpan body come to me. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a good time. I need to get a copy of that. No, well, guys, I think that's probably enough for uh, for today. I think we got a good start. You guys know what a romance is. I think we've set up what's going to happen for the next part, things to look out for. So. It shall be good when we finish it next uh, Monday. All right. So take care, guys. See you next time. See you.